Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'd like to this morning especially thank uh, Kelly Cole, who is a registered nurse, MSN and family nurse practitioner. Thank you for being with us today. And registered nurse Kelty Baker is here with us today. And I'm also happy to be joined today by Representative Tammy Nichols. I also do have letter of support from 19 lawmakers. I, we invited lawmakers to be here today, but not everyone could be here. But we do have letters of support from 19 lawmakers here in Idaho. So I want to express my appreciation and support to the elected officials and to our practitioners for being here today. I also wish to extend my gratitude to all of Idaho's healthcare workers, including those who have decided against taking the vaccination. Um, and as you can see, we have a lot of citizens that are standing with us here today as well. So thank you all for being here today for your support. Your tireless work over the last year and a half and has been selfless and heroic. And I am sorry that your employers are now turning their backs on you. We are here today to discuss the recent announcement that some Idaho employers intend to terminate their employees because of personal health decisions, that they have decided for whatever reason to not take the COVID-19 vaccine. This idea of discriminating against and firing employees based on private and personal health decisions flies in the face of the principles of liberty and justice. This decision has led to unnecessary concerns. Would the layoffs of doctors, nurses, vendors, and others at hospitals create a healthcare crisis or cause Idahoans to pay more for health care? Would it limit the ability of our hospitals to undertake their responsibilities? If other private sector companies decide to implement vaccine mandates, how would it impact Idaho's workforce? How many would lose their jobs? It has been a difficult couple year and a half for Idahoans. The underlying health concerns related to the virus were compounded by authoritarian actions of government that, that not only exacerbated the harm done, but wreaked untold physical, emotional, and psychological toll on men, women, and children. Our liberty has been under constant assault, and sadly, these attacks have not abated. If you want the vaccine, it is readily available. Anyone who wants it can get it. Those who choose to get the vaccine are not facing discrimination or termination. Operation Warp Speed was a major accomplishment for the Trump administration and for Americans. President Trump's administration was able to produce a vaccine in record time that has already been given to more than 180 million Americans. According to the most recent data, approximately 40% of Idahoans have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and 37% of Idaho's population is fully vaccinated. So what does a vaccine mandate mean for the majority of Idahoans who aren't vaccinated? It is important to understand the economic, health, and policy implications of such a mandate before it is implemented. Good public policy is forward-looking. We have the opportunity and the responsibility to discuss the issue and develop a comprehensive solution, one that does not grind Idaho's economy to a halt and that protects our personal freedoms. The issue here today is not the effectiveness of the vaccine. The issue at hand is a matter of individual liberty and freedom. 
Those who have made the personal medical choice not to take this vaccine deserve to have their decisions respected. No one, excuse me. Thousands of Idahoans are facing discrimination or termination because of their personal health decisions. Last week, I called on the Idaho legislature to reconvene and take action to protect hardworking Idahoans. Alternative, alternatively, the executive branch could intervene. Idaho must be more proactive in protecting individual liberty. Waiting until our freedoms and livelihoods are directly impacted is not leadership. It is avoiding the issue because it is just too difficult or too controversial to discuss. We must not run from tough issues or eschew difficult debates. Instead of hiding bills in drawers, we need to have open and honest discussion about Idahoans' concerns and the solutions necessary to address them. Burying our head in the sand has a long history of failure. Now we are behind, searching for solutions to address problems that could have been preempted. So because Idaho state government has failed to act, we now find ourselves in a situation today where individual Idahoans could be compelled to either get vaccinated or lose employment. I am here to highlight the threat facing Idahoans and the consequences that come from kicking the can down the road on important policy issues. We have a small window of opportunity, just eight weeks before these vaccine mandates are scheduled to take effect. We must take action before thousands of Idaho workers are fired. I have submitted some opening remarks today. I do have individuals that are here that would also like to make some remarks. And so at this point, I will turn the time over to them and then I will follow with some, con some concluding remarks. Good morning, fellow concerned citizens. I'm Kelly Cole. I'm here on behalf of my husband, Dr. Ryan Cole. And um, he was unable to attend today due to some scheduled surg surgical obligations. I also have a medical background. Um, I have a master's degree in nursing and spent years as an obstetrical nurse and in nursing education and subsequently in practice administration. In the last year, we have both lived and breathed COVID-19 as we have worked days and nights together in our medical laboratory serving patients coming through our lab for testing. I can tell you firsthand that Dr. Cole has spent nearly every waking hour and some hours that should have been sleeping hours studying, reading, listening, and researching every bit of information about SARS-CoV-2 that he can find. His background in immunology and virology provide for a deep understanding of this disease. His guiding principle in medicine has always been the patient comes first. He cares deeply about his fellow humans and maintains the highest ideals of what it means to be a physician. I would like to share a few words from Dr. Cole in support of, of many of our dedicated and esteemed healthcare colleagues who now find themselves facing a challenging and unethical conundrum. I implore those who have come to a medically unnecessary and illogical decision of an investigational ma vaccine mandate to post haste reconsider. This unilateral, non consensual decision is dividing our dedicated community of healthcare workers those who have built your institutions through providing the hands-on day-to-day patient care vital to a functioning healthcare system. This mandate devalues their years of dedicated service and endangers their physical and mental well-being, their livelihood, and potentially their long-term health. An effective healthcare system is built on trust. Mandates undermine trust within that system. They demonstrate the administration does not adequately trust their employees to make responsible health care choices. They cause employees and patients to lose trust in the system administration to believe that they have their best interests at heart. And they sow mistrust in the very treatment that is being mandated. 
Research finds that honest conversations about benefits and potential risks of a procedure or treatment creates more trust between patients and providers and is vital to effective medical treatment. Vaccine mandates seem to be ignoring basic immunology. Many, many workers in these systems have already had COVID. The COVID recovered have a natural immunity which is longer lasting, broader, and more robust than vaccine-induced immunity. These individuals should be granted the same medical social status as those who have been vaccinated. There is no medical reason for these individuals to be re-exposed to the immunogenic spike protein. In fact, there's strong evidence that shows that they are an increased risk of adverse reactions post-shot. Screening patients for COVID antibodies prior to vaccination could drastically decrease their risk for adverse reactions related to vaccination. Vaccination mandates clearly indicate an unwillingness to consider options for prophylaxis and early treatment of patients with therapies shown to be effective against the virus, which have been prescribed by thousands of doctors around the world, saving countless lives. The treat these treatments are saving patients at rates significantly higher than the current governmental standards of care. Mandates also indicate an unwillingness to acknowledge the long-term risks to those receiving the experiment and the unwillingness to acknowledge that in medicine, at times the most honest answer of all is, we don't know. The FDA emergency authorization clearly states that these shots are optional. The vaccine does not have FDA approval and as such remains investigational. It is unethical to coerce with the threat of job loss an employee into an experimental, non-improved investigational vaccine that carries serious risk of adverse reactions. Currently, there are more reported deaths, over 9,000 per the CDC's VAERS data, adverse events, 438,000, hospitalizations, urgent care visits, and office visits from these investigational vaccines in six months than have been reported for all other vaccines combined in decades of adverse event tracking. No one should have to risk their life and livelihood, their integrity and personal sovereignty to an experiment for which we don't know the long-term outcomes for potential disability, infertility, autoimmune disease, and cancer. We don't know. How soon we forget history. After World War II in the Nuremberg trials, we as a nation and world codified that we would never again experiment without consent or through coercion on humanity. Vaccination is an important tool in the worldwide fight against all kinds of disease. We support sensible vaccination guidelines for vaccines with long-term proven safety data. Vaccination should be based on the principle of my body, my choice. Information is readily available on the benefits and potential risks of vaccination. Individuals understand their own health status best and should be allowed to assess whether or not the benefits of vaccination are of value to them individually without the threat of losing their job based on that choice. Generally speaking, we as fellow Idaho business owners agree that less government intervention in our business is better. However, that, that belief is based on trusting that those businesses are caring for the, all their employees, the majority and the minority. So we implore Senator Bedke and the Idaho Senate to allow the anti-mandate bill passed by the House to have its day in open hearing, debate, and honest vote. Please pull the said bill out of the drawer and for the protection of our vital healthcare workers. Modern medicine and our leaders need to wake up from their current trance and stupor. Someday we will look back in shock as we reflect on what we have done with our lack of deference to science, obvious evidence, and history. The freedom to one's health, self-determination without medical coercion should always stand supreme. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Kelty Baker. I'm a registered nurse as well as a doctor of nursing practice student. I'm going to address the effects that this vaccine, vaccination mandate will have on nursing staff shortages. 
Currently, according to the Idaho Nursing Workforce's 2020 report, Idaho has 18,387 registered nurses and 3,716 LPNs, with approximately 1,200 either not working or seeking employment. As of this report, which was completed last fall, this number falls below what Idaho's employment demands. So what does this look like? What does short nursing shortages, what does that look like? It looks like waiting in the ER for hours while the panic in your heart <clears throat> slowly builds because your child struggles to breathe. It looks like a new mother who was scheduled for an induction because of health concerns for her and her baby worries as it slowly gets pushed back hours and days. And when she finally gets in, the C-section that the provider was trying to avoid is the outcome. It also means that nurses who gave their all during this pandemic are still being asked to work more shifts, work past their shift time. <clears throat> They're being asked to take on a patient load that is well beyond what is deemed safe. They are, <clears throat> sorry, the mother who has been waiting in that ER for hours, those nurses will be the ones to asked to float to the floor where that child is going to be admitted, while leaving the patient load that they were previously assigned to, to another nurse who already has well past a safe patient load. It means nurses who have just finished their first or second year on the floor are now responsible for training newly graduated nurses instead of seasoned nurses. I've heard an estimate of 30% of medical and nursing staff will be affected by this mandate. 30% of medical staff will lose their jobs in September. 30% may not seem like a large number, but in context, 30% of nurses, both RNs and LPNs, in the three districts that both St. Al's and Luke's cover is approximately 3,800 nurses. 3,800 nurses, fewer nurses for patient care. Imagine your ER wait times then. Imagine what the nursing patient ratios will look like then. And it's going to impact our rural areas even more than it's going to impact the Treasure Valley because rural areas already suffer a huge healthcare access gap. Imagine if those hospitals and rural areas fail. Imagine if their clinics shut their doors. Nurses are advocates, we're educators. We provide education to our patients about the consequences of not following the prescribed plan of care. Don't take your blood pressure meds, you might have a heart attack. Stop taking your blood thinners, you actually might suffer from a, smoke, a stroke. If we continue down this path, community, community health will suffer as a direct result of an even greater nursing shortage because we fail to take a stand and to allow our healthcare professionals to make their own personal health decisions. We need to stand up. Thank you. Good morning. I am Representative Tammy Nichols from District 11 in Canyon County. And I was asked to speak in regards to the legislative aspect of what we are currently facing. I and many of my fellow colleagues have received hundreds of emails, phone calls, and messages in regards to the concerns of what is currently taking place. I wanted to go over some of the things that the legislature ha has done and did this last session and where we currently stand in regards to those. We had several bills that we proposed because we could see what was going to transpire as we went down this road and we were concerned with what might transpire both on the state and federal level. So there were several pieces of legislation that were taken um, on behalf of the legislature this session and I wanted to give you an update on those. We started with House Bill 140 which was brought to us by Representative Giddings. This bill was to um, it was in regards to unvaccinated persons and that employers or companies that contract with the state shall not discriminate against them. This passed the House, but unfortunately when it went over to the Senate side, it was held in the drawer of Senator Patrick because he would not allow it to have a hearing. This bill would help our current situation that we are in. 
House Bill 301, which was brought to us by Representative Monks, was in regards to employers assuming liability um, if it requires its employees to receive a vaccination and damages arise to that employee. This bill was not allowed to move forward. It was only introduced, and that was the end of it, unfortunately, because that bill also would help us in our current situation. House Bill 339, which was brought to us by Representative Hanks, had to do with mask mandates and, the, uh, and prohibiting the state and political subdivisions or any office of the state from mandating masks. This passed the House as well, but when it went over to the Senate, unfortunately, Chairman Martin of, in the Health and Welfare Senate side would not allow it to have a hearing. I proposed House Bill 63. This bill would prohibit the use of forced vaccinations, immunizations, genetic modulations, or inoculations. This bill had overwhelming support by both the people in Idaho as well as the other representatives. Unfortunately, also, uh, uh, Chairman Wood of the House Health and Welfare Committee would not allow me to have a hearing. I debated back and forth on what I was going to do with this bill and decided, as the time was running low, to go ahead and introduce it as a personal bill so that I could get the information out to the public. I contacted Representative Wood and asked him, please let me allow this bill to come in. I had many emails, we had all, all of my legislative colleagues had many emails in regards to this issue. He told me that basically that this would never happen in Idaho, and if the feds forced it upon us, there would be nothing we could do about it. So what I did instead is I took the essence of House Bill 63, and I moved it into a resolution which does not enforce law, but is a statement of the legislative body. Um, it was HCR 14, and this resolution passed the House unanimously. Unfortunately, again, when it went over to the Senate side, the senator, uh, the committee senator, um, Martin, would not allow me to introduce it into the Health and Welfare Committee. Again, this passed the House unanimously, completely bipartisan. It had both support from the Democrats as well as the Republicans. I called, I emailed, I pleaded. In fact, the day it passed the House, he uh, had his secretary email me, or call me actually, and asked me to send over this resolution, which I did. And uh, after that, I heard nothing. And so I started emailing, I started making phone calls over to there, asking if it had been placed on the calendar and to no avail, it had not. So where are we at right now? Well, the House did not sign a die. We went into recess, the Senate did. But the Senate could come back into session at any time. They could come back tomorrow if they wanted to and take up the bills that are sitting in drawers and get those passed. Um, the current issues that we're facing in the state regarding mandates of shots and other issues could be handled at this time. We could help all of our fellow Idahoans at this moment. Consequently, the legislature as a whole could take up the new RS um, that I have for HB 63 to address force mandates and shots. The House chose not to sign a die for the very reasons knowing that issues such as this would probably arise as well as others, and that they would need to be addressed during this uncertain time that we are living in. And, we, and how many people are wondering currently, what is going on in Idaho? Well, it's time for us to step up. The job of the government is to protect and uphold the rights of the people, and that is what we need to do at this time. So myself and many of my fellow legislators would like us to be called back into session to be able to address these concerns and to be able to protect the Idahoans that have worked so hard for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Kelty, for being here, making time out of your day to be with us today and have your voice be heard on this very important issue. Thank you, Representative Nichols, and to the members of the legislature who have made an attempt to deal straight on with this important issue for Idahoans. No one should be forced to choose between keeping their job and taking a vaccine authorized for emergency use when doing so violates their conscience. This decision is a personal choice. It is not the government's business. 
I would also point out that protecting Idahoans from coerced vaccination is not a mandate on businesses. A mandate is making a store that sells running shoes have a wheelchair ramp. A mandate is making a business shut down for weeks because the government says so. A mandate is requiring trees in the middle of a parking lot. A mandate is requiring business to keep their customers six feet apart. Throughout the last 16 months, I have stressed the importance of individual liberty and personal choice. Decisions about masks, social distancing, vaccines, and other personal health choices should be made by the individual. This is the principle I encourage all to keep in mind as we seek to address this issue. The legislature had an opportunity to deal with these issues during the spring, but they did not. They left multiple bills on the table that addressed the danger of certain vaccine mandates. Now, just a few months later, this distant threat has materialized and thousands of Idahoans are facing discrimination or termination because of their personal health decisions. In my office, we have received over, uh, to date, over 405 phone calls, emails, messages. Uh, by far the majority of them are in agreement that we need to address this issue. And I'm also holding in my hand some copies of written testimony from Idahoans. So in conclusion, my concluding remarks today, that even if the legislature chooses not to reconvene, solutions do exist that can be pursued to protect Idahoans from facing discrimination or termination for their personal health choices. Idahoans are gathering to rally and protest against mandates that violate their personal choice. I have received hundreds of calls and emails from constituents applauding my request to convene a session of the legislature and calling on the Speaker of the House. The time for action is now. Shame on us if Idaho's elected representatives stand by and allow Idahoans to face discrimination and or termination while we throw up our hands and say that we don't want to have this discussion. We owe Idahoans much more than that. We have just eight weeks until thousands of Idahoans are facing termination due to vaccine mandates. Idaho State employees have protections from so-called vaccine mandates. Hospital and other private sector employees deserve the same protections. Today, I call on Idaho's hospitals and healthcare companies to drop their va vaccine mandate so that we may have a chance to sit down together, discuss these issues associated with the mandate and the infringement on personal health care decisions in greater detail. Also, we need to better understand how broad and far-reaching the impact of such mandates would be, not only in the health care field, but also on other industries contemplating mandates. Simply allowing private sector companies to impose mandates without looking at how these decisions impact employees and the big picture economic impacts on Idaho's economy makes no sense. I am confident that we can find effective solutions, but we can't if we don't even have the debate and the discussion. So today, in conjunction with Dr. Cole, we have written request to the, the administrators of each of the hospitals that issued their mandate last week, calling on them to drop the mandate and let's all come to the table, signed by myself and Dr. Ryan Cole, because that is a solution. So thank you to all of you who have been here today to let's have this discussion. Thank you, this is so important to the people of Idaho. Thanks to the presenters, thanks to all that are standing here with us in solidarity. I have spoken with each of the presenters and at this point in time, we are all happy to answer any questions from the media.
Madam Governor. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Um, Scott Logan with Channel 2. Uh, I know politicians, including yourself, have been critical of uh, so-called federal overreach by the government. Isn't what you're talking about state overreach by telling the, the, the state officials, telling private businesses what to do? Well, S Scott, yes. thank you for the question, Scott. Uh, your question implies what I have addressed in my speech, that this would be a mandate from, from the government. That it, it is not a mandate from the government. It is a matter of respecting the individual choice of Idahoans. Well, I, I guess in follow-up, ma'am, uh, do you think that uh, the men and women who run the health care systems in our state uh, perhaps know more about it than you do? <laughs> well, Scott, obviously those the majority of those that are here today it sounds to me like they are from the healthcare profession. Yes. Yes. And so I So I absolutely respect the professionals that are here today who do know more and we, and we heard a lot of the testimony of their circumstances and the conditions of their their working environment. Thank you for answering the question, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Lieutenant Governor, since, yes. you, since you wrote to Speaker Bedke, he has signaled that he's going to take some time to analyze this issue. What conversations have you had with other senators? What conversations have you had with the governor's office on this issue? How long do you wait before you possibly take matters into your own hands? I've heard you've signed executive orders in the past. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yesterday, we extended an invitation to all members of the legislature to either be here today or submit written comments of support. And then we, do, we did hear back from some lawmakers, 19 of them in total. Yesterday, I did meet with the governor, and I sincerely extended my, my offer of, Governor, what can we do to work together to address the situation? Because, as I said, we don't, if the legislature chooses not to reconvene, and my, my letter to the Speaker of the House last week, it was not a demand, as some have been characterized it as being a demand that the legislature come back into session. It was a formal request of the Speaker of the House. So, if the legislature chooses not to reconvene, as I said, there are other solutions. The, le the executive branch could get involved, and that's what these letters are. And, and, and I did ask the governor yesterday if we could both work together on this issue to resolve this. And the, that discussion with the governor was prior to my discussion with Dr. Ryan Cole when we came up with this letter of of request to the hospital administrators. But there is room, there's additional room on this letter for another signature from our governor. Are you prepared to sign an executive order at your earliest chance? Well, that's a good question because at some point today, I will be acting governor. Um, <laughs> The disadvantage that I have is that the letter that we received in our office yesterday requesting that I serve as acting governor did not place a time limit on when that would be. Ruth. Hi, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, you are a business owner. As you well know, Idaho is an at-will state. Do you support at-will employment, that is? Do you support changing Idaho's at-will employment status or the policy? 
your question, Ruth, is do I support the status Idaho's law of at-will employment? No, I do not support changing that. But don't all of the hospitals and medical providers, they are private businesses, therefore they can decide whether or not to terminate their employees. So by being an at-will state, that is the reason that they can terminate these employees. I believe that we have, we absolutely have the ability to make determinations about how to run our companies and what kind of standards that we want to place on our employees for our companies. However, as an employer, when it comes to me dictating my, my personal view on my employees, no matter what medical decision it is, that's where I draw the line. As an employer, it is important, it is critical that I respect the individual autonomy of the person. And that is what a successful business model is. That is conscious capitalism, where we work together as a business community, having a successful model that builds, the, pro the business provides a good service, a good product in an environment that builds and supports our employees. We will not be successful without our employees. You, they're, they're here. We must, as employers, provide the right em environment for them, including good pay, good benefits, motivation, incentives, so that they can provide for their families and then in turn also give back to the community. So I think some of the hospital providers would argue that these folks' medical decisions as far as whether or not they get vaccinated impacts the health of their patients. So the, well, I guess what would you say to that? Well, and that's legitimate. That is a good legitimate concern. And we should be talking about that. That's all we're asking for in these times, in these days, is that we, we should be having the debate, we should be having the conversation on how to deal with these issues. And why not have the individual um, provide another, why not deal with individuals on a case-by-case -case basis? That if we find out that somebody has been exposed to the virus, and, and Kelly mentioned that, that those who have been exposed to the virus and then are, f so they have the automatic immuni immunity built up. So if they're forced to take a vaccine against their will, that in some cases may have a negative impact on their health, why does the, their natural immunity not have equal importance of a vaccination? That's, we just want to have this discussion, and it is possible to come to a resolution on this important issue. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, I just wanted to ask, um, could you clarify whether you're asking for um, some of those bills that you talked about um, would have banned all vaccine mandates? Could you clarify whether you're asking the session to um, ban specifically COVID-19 vaccines, or are you wanting it to be broader than that um, to address, you know, there's all kinds of vaccines that hospitals require. For well, thanks for giving me a lot more authority than I have as the Lieutenant Governor. This is a le policy issue that belongs in the hands of the legislature. And that is, you know, the legislature, if they choose to reconvene, another option that legislative leadership could do is convene a, a handful of individual lawmakers to do a deep dive into this. You know, one of the questions that I asked the governor yesterday is, what's driving this? Why are we having this conversation today about a, ma a, max, a, a mandate, a vaccine mandate, when we weren't having this conversation a month ago? What's driving this? Let's get to the bottom of what is driving this. Is this something that we need to examine as far as, you know, is this a requirement that's coming from the money that we're receiving from the federal government? I don't know. I don't know that. But, but it's worth 
doing a deep dive and some people really getting into this and talking with the hospital administrators, talking with the Department of Health and Welfare, really understanding, talking with the Director of Emergency Management to understand really what's driving this. Because we, we cannot make these decisions in a vacuum and not even want to talk about the potential negative economic impact on our workforce. This is starting in our healthcare facilities, but it may set a precedence for other companies. And when the statistics show that 60% of Idahoans have not received the vaccination, that must indicate something. And so if the mandate is put on there for all employees that they must get this vaccination or be fired, that would be a devastating result for our state, for our economy. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions. First off, can you say definitively whether you will or will not sign an executive order involving vaccine mandates and that thing that to I mean, I can't. Thanks for the question. Will I sign an executive order? I can't even think about that because I don't know the time frame that I have the authority to do that. But I will say that this is of such importance that I believe that the legislature needs to be engaged in this issue. This isn't, this isn't all about the, the action of one individual. The legislative body is tasked with enacting policy in the state of Idaho. Uh, but I will just use the opportunity to once again call upon the Speaker of the House to convene the, legis convene the House of Representatives or look at putting some of your lawmakers on a task force so that we can study this, put a pause, study it, and truly understand how this action might affect our state. Yes, Kevin. Uh, Representative Nichols listed all the bills that failed in the last session of the session of some going on. Why do you think any of those bills would now pass if they reconvene? Well, to answer your question, um, Keith, as mentioned earlier, you know, two or three months ago in the spring, some lawmakers didn't recognize that this might be a threat in our state. They, they, readily acknowledged that this would never happen in Idaho. So several months later, here we are. This is where we're at. I'm a business owner. I prefer to deal proactively with things rather than waiting till where we are today to deal with things. I think it's just much better planning and foresight and leadership for our state. Yes, Betsy. You mentioned some other types of government mandates on businesses, such as the requirement that a business that sells running shoes have a wheelchair access ramp. Do you think the governor, the government should not make those kinds of mandates on businesses? I didn't. Betsy, thanks for the question there about government mandates. I did not, I am not taking a position on a certain mandate like a, like a wheelchair ramp, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I happen to be an advocate for people who have disabilities in my 10 year service of the, in the House of Representatives. I worked very hard to represent and support the thousands of Idahoans that live here who have some sort of, of developmental disability. So I'm not making a judgment on that type of a mandate from government, I'm just trying, simply trying to point out the difference between what, how I view what a government mandate is as compared to what we view as respecting the rights of the individual. Yes, sir. Yes. Hi. Uh, excuse me, Brian with Channel 7. Uh, you mentioned um, the discrimination on uh, employer, that employees can give to employers based on a medical procedure. What if, and don't you think this might be a slippery slope if, if say, one of, an employee had a, an operation for a, a gender change operation, and an employer decided they were not going to employ them anymore because they didn't believe it because of religious reasons. How is that different than you saying this discrimination based on medical procedure is not the same? Well, Brian, I just think those are two completely separate issues. <laughs> That 
So government overreach, telling a private business how they can discriminate against an employee? Again, that's a separate issue. Yeah. And that should be, if that's a policy that the state of Idaho wants to adopt, this is where it belongs. It belongs in the, within the legislature and that they would bring these ideas forward and then the people of Idaho could come forward and testify either for or against any such policy that you're recommending. I have a quick follow up then. And I'll get back to, I guess, a closer topic. Let's say there's a chiropractor Meridian that doesn't want to serve uh, patients that have had the vaccine. What if he requires the same of his employees to not get the vaccine? I get, oh, can you restate the question? A, chiro a chiropractor in Meridian? doesn't want to serve patients that have had the vaccine. What if he required the same of his employees saying, you can't work here if you had the vaccine? Well, I think that's a dumb thing. It's a dumb decision by the chiropractor. I mean, seriously, we, if you were, if you were, if you are an employer in the state of Idaho right now, you know how difficult it is to find employees right now. And I would never do, as an employer, I would never do anything silly like that because I want my, I want my employees and my business to take care of the needs of our customers. But you would have a right to do that. It's, it's, he may, but that's a silly, that's silly for, for a business owner to, to run people off like that. Um, so um, we do have a big rally that's uh, getting ready to take place very shortly on the steps of the Capitol. So I, I want to encourage all of you that are here today, the reporters, thank you for being here for listening to our voice, for your questions. I would also encourage you to be, to go outside in the steps of the Capitol to, to observe what's, hap what's going to happen out there and for all of us to show support for the people of Idaho that are making time out of their day to come to the Capitol today. So I'll take one, one or two more questions and then, that'll, then we'll wrap it up. Yes, um, sir. Would your stance on this situation change when the FDA gets full approval of the vaccines? My, I, again, I do not, my underlying principle is that the, no individual should be forced to do something against their conscience on a medical procedure. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. So these hospitals and medical providers are saying, we understand this may be a difficult decision for some people to get the vaccine, but we are asking people to do this to protect our patients that are vulnerable. So that situation that you just described, does it go both ways for you? They're not asking, they're telling. Yeah, well, well just, just to follow up on your question and some of the remarks that were made, um, across today, why, why today, why, why now are they coming out with this mandate and we, they weren't coming out with this a month or two ago. We need to get to the bottom of what is driving this mandate and, and I think the best thing would be for the business owners, the employers, to deal directly one-on-one -on -one with their employees and to respect their rights and find a way that, that everyone can work together to protect the health and safety of not just the employee, but our customers as well. One last question and then we'll wrap up. Yes, go ahead. The American Hospital Association has identified medical liability as one of the concerns for not requiring vaccination against COVID-19. Uh, in the event that somebody goes to the hospital and catches COVID-19, provably from somebody who is a medical care provider. Would you, what would you do in the case of the legislature potentially mandating no vaccination requirement in this medical case? How are you also going to protect those hospitals from liability since the liability law that's currently in effect has a sunset clause? Well, <laughs> there are, okay, so to answer that question, that issue was addressed 
in the last special session of the legislature last August, and thank you to the lawmakers for addressing that issue, because this is a disease, it's a virus, it is not anybody's fault, it is not the fault of a business owner or, or any person. If, if the infectious disease goes from one person to the next, it's a human condition, it is nobody's fault. I thank the legislature for giving blanket immunity to all businesses, all health care providers, and if we need to, I haven't checked the sunset date. What is the sunset date on that? Do you know? Uh, so if that goes through December 31st, then we should be covered on that. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. This has been a great conversation, and I don't know why we don't have more of this, so thank you. Thanks.